We have looked <clears throat> through the first seven chapters here. <clears throat> we started out with the, the uh, power of the gospel. That's the dynamite that changes lives. We saw in the first two chapters there the light of creation, the light of conscience, the light of the commandments, the light of Christians. Uh, <clears throat> we saw the just condemnation of Billy Better Than You, uh, reverent religious and Harry the heathen, and we saw the complete condemnation of all mankind in chapter 3, and we saw a beautiful picture of salvation by grace there towards the end of chapter 3. Uh, we saw the illustration of Abraham, the corroboration of David, and the explanation of salvation by grace in chapter 4. In chapter 5, we saw uh, basically the idea that there are two families on earth, and that is the family of the first Adam and the family of the second Adam, which is Christ. All of us claim to know Christ. And so the Bible says then in chapter 6, uh, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's what a lot of people teach today. Just do what you want to because I mean, you just tell the Lord that you're sorry and you just keep rolling on. But the Bible says uh, that we should know that we're buried with Christ and we're risen to walk in newness of life and we should reckon it to be so. In other words, we should... We should decide to do it. We should consider it done. Or as Charles said, we should expect it to be done, expect it to be so in our life, and then to yield to obedience, I mean, yield to righteousness and yield not to unrighteousness. In other words, we make the decision that we're going to do what it takes to bring this to pass. And then all that sounds good, but if we don't follow through with obedience, then then we haven't getting any, gotten anywhere. <clears throat> And we saw in chapter 7, the letter of the law uh, versus walking by the Spirit. And Paul aptly explains to us at the end of chapter 7 that we are, for lack of better terminology, two-thirds saved. If you're saved this morning, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord, then your soul is saved and your spirit is saved, but your flesh won't be saved until you go to heaven either by death or rapture. So though I want to do what's right, if I follow after the Spirit, I'm going to do the right things, and if I follow after the flesh, I'm going to do the wrong things, okay? Another way to talk about being two-thirds saved is... Uh, I'm saved from the penalty of sin. I've called on Christ, so I never have to worry about the fires of hell or the fires of the lake of fire. Uh, <clears throat> I am being saved from the power of sin as I submit to the Holy Spirit moment by moment, and then I shall be saved from the very presence of sin when I go to heaven either by death or rapture. And it is on that idea of the two-thirds salvation and how we should walk that we enter into chapter 8. Let's have a word of prayer and then we will read chapter 8. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of preaching your word. I thank you for the things that you've taught me as I've chewed on this chapter all week long. I pray that you would help me, Lord, and pray not help me to speak, but I pray that you would speak through me to give the truth of this chapter, Lord, and that the saved people here this morning may be encouraged uh, to walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh or carnality, Lord. I pray that uh, you you would help the, if there be one here that doesn't know you that today would be their new birth, the day of their salvation, the day that they have become saved from the penalty of sin, that they might start to be saved from the power of sin as they submit to you. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Christ's name and for his honor alone. Amen. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made, a, made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Verse number four, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The verb mind the things of the Spirit is understood there. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is, not the, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, 
but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For if ye have not received the spirit of bondage, excuse me, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. To put that in our terminology today, that's where we cry, Daddy. Or as we used to say in Alabama, daddy. Daddy, daddy. It's a term of endearment. Verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And of children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that... The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why did he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, I'm glad it doesn't say we think. It doesn't say maybe. It says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sore? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I love that phrase, more than conquerors. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I would say that is so rich and so deep. I almost feel like we need to pray again that we might understand everything's in that chapter. That, I mean, that's deep water right there. There is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. If you're saved this morning, 
you are absolved. What does that mean? The word absolved means that no accusation can be made against you. It is as if, Devin, that you have never, not only never sinned, but never been a sinner. But you were a sinner when you were born, just like I am. We were all, we're all born into sin. Now, the book of Ephesians says it this way, that <clears throat> we're the children of wrath and the children of disobedience. In other words, I'm a sinner because I'm human and I sin, so I'm disobedient. I am sin because my daddy was a sinner all the way back to Adam, and I sin because sometimes I just want to. It's true for every one of us. We're sinners by choice and sinners by birth. But if I've called on Christ, if I'm saved, even though I'm just two-thirds saved because my flesh still wants to do evil at times, I'm absolved. That means I'm not only forgiven, no man can even make an accusation. Again. Oh, he might make it here. I had a guy tell me this week I was evil. Okay? <clears throat> and uh, I told him he just thought I was evil because he refused to be directed or corrected. He didn't want my help. So it's not that people, but really, does people's opinion, let me see if I can't say this grammatically correct. Do the opinions of people really matter? I should care what their opinions are, Kimmy, but the opinion I should be most concerned about is the opinion of my Lord. And my Lord says no man can make an accusation against me because Christ paid the price. Jesus paid it all. <laughs> Woo, that's good. How, do we, how are we supposed to live now that we are absolved? The Bible uses the word carnal. And the way I try to help, I, older people seem to just instantly know what that is, but we've got several younger people here today, and younger people seem to struggle with that term carnal. So not trying to, to assume that you don't know something that you do, but trying to be sure you know something, so don't, don't try to take offense to me trying to help you understand it. But what do you call somebody, that, uh, some animal that just eats meat? What do you call them? Go ahead. A carnivore. It's the same root word. Okay? Carn. Carnal means fleshly. Okay? It's like I've tried to explain it before. Uh, my dad, we looked at Galatians 5 a little bit last week when we were talking about this two-thirds say. The fruit of the flesh is, or the works of the flesh are manifest, which are, and it lists them out there in Galatians chapter 5. Let me, let me read those to you real quick. I know we talked about it last week, but just, just a, a quick moment in, in review. He says <clears throat> that uh, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Those are basically all sexual sins. Idolatry, that's worshiping something in the place of Christ. Witchcraft, that's living by the craft or the power of a witch. Her power, his power comes from Satan. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Uh, that's just basically argument and, and angry fights, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So if you're saved this morning, you basically have the righteous Spirit of God living in your soul, but your flesh is still alive. If I flee, feed my flesh with things then my flesh is going to control how I walk. If I feed the spirit that is within me, the things of God, then the spirit's going to want to control my life. So the question is not am I saved or lost, not am I going to lose my salvation or am I going to work hard to keep my salvation. The question is am I going to live according to my body that I know is evil or am I going to live according to the spirit? I'm adopted, I mean, I, I'm, I'm absolved, but how am I going to walk? Am I going to walk in the flesh? Because if I walk in the flesh, man, I'm angry. I'm, I'm, I'm into things I shouldn't be into. How do we feed the flesh? Can you tell me how we feed the flesh? Yeah, anybody, young or old. It's, we've got young and old over here. We've got middle-aged over here, so I won't call anybody. You tell me. 
How do you feed the flesh? How do you walk by the flesh? Come on, it overwhelms me when y'all all talk at one time. Give me an idea. How do you feed the flesh? What'd you say? Living in the world. Well, you're right, but yet we all have to live in the world, right? So basically, you've got you've got your eye gate, your ear gate, your mouth gate. I don't know how you smell. So I, guess, I mean, I guess your 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 nose works too. You got your five senses, <clears throat> and you've got your spirit. By concentrating on those world of things. In other words, <clears throat> if you listen to stuff that's always talking about uh, smoking dope, getting drunk, getting high, getting with somebody I'm not married to, I'm feeding the flesh. If you dwell on those things, you may say, well, I don't do any of those things. Jesus taught in the Gospels if we're thinking about that, even though we're not doing it, we're kind of wishing we were doing it. That it's just as guilty as if we actually followed through and did it. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Sing hymns all the time? I'm not dumb enough to think that anybody in the room is going to listen to hymns all the time, but it would be the best choice. Because when I listen to when I, I listen to secular music, I've got two teenage boys that ride with me, so you know, and sometimes I turn it on. And if I've turned it on in the eighties, Nearly every song from the 80s is talking about sex. Those of you who listen to music from the 80s, you turn your thinking cap on when you're listening to music from the 80s, and nearly every one of them is talking about sex. When I listen to the secular music from today's age, there are some exceptions, but nearly everything we listen to is talking about getting drunk, getting high, getting with somebody I'm not married to. If we listen to that all the time, it's going to be, it's just like we were talking about in Sunday school. For some of us, that's not a struggle. We don't struggle with the desire to get drunk. We don't just struggle with the desire to get high. We don't struggle with the desire to get with somebody that we're not married to. Because we're kind of beyond that in our Christian walk. But the younger you are, the more help you need, and the easier it's going to be for you to do the right thing if you don't put that in your head. Can you listen to that and still walk by the Spirit? I'm going to say it's possible, but it's kind of like Dustin, is, is he's got wheels, all right? Everybody that's watched a Smith football game knows Dustin has wheels. Dustin, has, Dustin can run and, and carry a five-gallon bucket of purple holes under each hand. But when he goes out to run that ball, Katie, he doesn't have no buckets. He's laid aside the weight <laughs> and the sin that does so easily beset us. That's what we have to do in our spiritual lives. The more things we can, the idea that is presented from most pulpits today is let's see how much like the world we can be and still be recognized as a Christian. Whereas, as I understand this right here, if we're walking according to the Spirit, I'm absolved from my sin, but if I'm going to walk according to the Spirit, then I need to see how much like Christ I can be and still be effective in the world around me. That's what he's asking us to do. How do we do that? Well, you're going down a little bit further. We're adopted. Let's look in verse 13. For ye live after the flesh. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. You're not going to lose your e eternal life, but... You're not going to be effective spiritually. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. It's not about, it's not about uh, <coughs> some uniform we have to put on to be Christian. It's not about I had to do this in order to maintain my salvation. It is the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We cry, Daddy. Now, I don't understand adoption because I've never been adopted and I've never adopted anybody. But as I understand the law, when someone is adopted, they can never be unadopted. Can never be, can never be turned away. They can never be cut out of the wheel if there is one. I'm in Christ. It is by His power that I'm led to walk 
according to the Spirit. But just like, now I know there are some who says you have no choice in salvation, but I don't think God created robots. He gave you the choice to accept Christ or reject Christ. And just like he's not going to take you by the ear and make you get saved, he's not going to take you by the ear and make you walk according to the flesh. He wants you to choose to. I love my wife. My wife loves me. I love her. It's a choice. I decided to love her when I first met her. But now, Charles decided to love Karen, I think, riding around in a Corvette in the snow. We went to dinner, and we just talked for several hours. I even met her mother, Dustin, on the first date. But I went to work the next day and said, I'm going to marry that girl. They didn't have anything good to say where I worked, Katie. Had nothing kind to say about that statement. But I knew she loved the Lord. I thought she was pretty. And I was going to see that she loved me back. I said, you give me 15 to 18 months. We'll be married. Fifteen months later, we were married. Not trying to make myself out to be Christ, but the Bible says I'm to be a picture of Christ as a husband. She loves me because I first loved her. But I didn't make her love me. I loved her, and she chose to love me. Charles didn't make Karen love him. He loved her. She chose to love him back. Hopefully that's true for every married couple we know. God's not going to make you serve him. He loves you, and he wants you to accept him as Lord and serve him in returning or reciprocating that love. You are adopted. He has written your name in the Lamb's book of life in his blood. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his Friends, and he called you friend because he died for you. Absolved. Walking according to the Spirit because you are adopted. Well, it's so tough, Brother John, to, to live for Christ in this age. And don't I know it? But you are always aided by the Spirit. Look over here towards the... Well, I don't know, but that may not lay on the same part of your page as it does on mine. Look towards about verse 24. We're saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why did he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience, that means endurance, continuance, wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For when we know not what we should pray for as we ought, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttereth. He searches the heart and knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. What is, <clears throat> excuse me, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You are always aided by the Spirit. He's always there. He's always there. You can't get rid of the Spirit. That's why when you go somewhere and do something that you know you shouldn't be doing, if you have been truly absolved, if you're truly saved, if your sin's been forgiven and no man can accuse you, the Holy Spirit's going, you know you shouldn't be here. You know you shouldn't be doing that. You know you shouldn't be thinking that. The Spirit is there to help us. And the Spirit's praying for us. Look, Satan, if you are absolved this morning, if you're truly saved, Satan does not want you to live a victorious life. He cannot take your soul from you, but he can keep you from reaching other people for Christ. The only thing better than going to heaven is taking somebody with you. Satan wants to defeat you. Think of what Christ said to Peter. Satan has desired to sift thee like wheat. But I prayed for you. The Holy Spirit is praying for you every day. Aided by the Spirit. Look at verse 31. 
the end of verse 31. Well, we'll just read the whole verse. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Look. The Spirit is there to aid you. The, the Bible calls him a comforter. That com The word comforter, I could impress you with the Greek word behind it, but it doesn't matter. Basically, that word comforter means it's somebody that comes alongside. Uh, <clears throat> Dustin didn't realize because he was so busy doing his part in the game, he didn't realize, I don't think till the game was over, that Bo had been injured. Am I right? <clears throat> when Bo was going off the field, he, he was in such pain he couldn't walk. So I played, Marlon, the part of the Holy Spirit. I come alongside him. On the side that was injured, I put his arm over my shoulder. And I held, held his weight so he didn't have to put weight on that leg. And we went in. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes alongside us. And when the, when the pressure's too great, when we don't see how we can do right in this situation, the Holy Spirit's right there going, you can do it. I'm helping you. I'm aiding you. You are always aided by the Spirit. Not only am I aided by the Spirit because He's there to help me and He's praying for me. Look, I'm always interceded for. I'm always interceded for. Look in verse uh, 32 to, to 34. <clears throat> He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with all, with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So as we understand the scriptures, God is a trinity. He is body, soul, and spirit. The body and spirit, which are Jesus and the Holy Spirit, are praying for us. They're interceding for us all the time. So it's kind of like they're there to, to hold us up and, and, and ask God to help us. I mean, that's a cheerleader and a coach like you've never seen right there. Because they are all powerful, always present, and know all things. And they're constantly praying for you and trying to help you live that Christian life. And if we're failing at living the Christian life, the fault is not the Spirit and the fault is not the Savior. The fault is us for not accepting their help. We willfully choose to walk by the flesh. And here's, here's the best part. I'm coming in for a landing. I'm anchored. I'm a, I started with absolution. I'm absolved of my sin. I am forgiven and no man can accuse me before God because I am forgiven. It is as though I never sinned. It is as though I was never a sinner. And it closes with I'm anchored in Christ. Look at these last few verses. 38. 37 to 39. In all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hyper Nike. Nike means victory. Hyper Nike. More than a victory. I am more than victorious through Christ. Because no matter what happens, Katie... I know I'm going to see him and I'm going to be like him because it is predestined that I be conformed into his image. I may not be and I don't think I will be completely in his image until I make it to heaven by death or rapture, but I shall be like him because God determined before he said, let there be light, that I'd be like him. That's what your Bible says. He knew you'd be saved and so he predestined that you be shaped or formed into Christ's image. And because I have all three parts of the Godhead on my side, or better stated, they put me on their side, amen, then I'm more than a conqueror. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, 
nor life, nor angels, nor principalities. That's like rulers, if I understand the word correctly. You have the principality of Mississippi, the principality of Smithville, the principality of Amory, this principality of Monroe County, the principality of these United States. So no government can separate me from him. No powers. Well, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Honestly, I look around, Dustin, at your generation, and it frightens me for the future for your generation. Because I'm just, I'm, I'm just preaching, but I'm preaching honestly as I can. Very few of your generation reads properly, writes properly, can do simple math. I was at a register yesterday, and I paid for something, and the lady put the wrong figure into the machine, and she had no, I had to tell her what change to give me. Ma'am, you owe me $15.37. She just took me at my word. I could have told her she owed me what the machine said and she would have done it, but she put in $5 too much, so we told her she owed me $20.37. She was just clueless. He said, that's bad. Yeah, but it's worse. Like I told that boy in school on Friday. Very much. Now, I believe I'm looking at some exceptions, and I know there are other exceptions, but as a generation, your generation will not be corrected or directed. That frightens me for you. But here's what I know. If you call on Christ and you allow him to control your life from this day forward, there may be difficult times because the Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But nothing will separate you from him. And come what may, you'll have the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father to get you through it. And that's my desire for y'all. Is that you would call on Christ. That's my desire for those of us who know Christ already. That we would allow him to do what he wants so lovingly to do. Which is come alongside us and hold us up. And help us do what he wants us to do. Help us be formed into his image. Are you absolved this morning? Do you know beyond any doubt that you are Jesus Christ's? Do you know the Bible? There's no guess so in salvation. This book right here says these things. Write I unto you that believe that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know this morning that your sins have been absolved? Do you know that you are in Christ and that no man can pluck you out? If you don't, please don't wait another day. When we give an invitation in a minute, let me take a Bible and show you how you can know that your sins are are absolved and that you are anchored to Christ for eternity. For those of us who do know that, the question is different. Are we walking according to the Spirit? Are we living the adopted life and allowing the Spirit to aid us? I'm going to shut up now. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege